So I read for us from Romans 14. I'm going to read the first nine verses. God's word says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself and none of us, none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that we might be Lord, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. This is God's words. Please, please be seated. Let's, and let's pray together. Gracious God, thanks again for uh, your word. Thanks again uh, for the fact that although power may fail and Everything else may fail. Your word will never fail. I pray now in that same vein that uh, it would transform us, help us to understand how better to follow, how better to serve, and how better to glorify you, Lord Jesus. We ask this in your name and ask that you would send your spirit again afresh and anew to open our hearts and our minds and to guard mine as I preach so that your word would be glorified. Amen. So back in, in 2019, and when I wrote that, I'm like, 2019 was only like four years ago, but doesn't it seem like forever ago? Really? 2019 seems so, like almost like another lifetime ago. But in 2019, I had the joy and the privilege of attending um, the Evangelical Free Church of America, our denomination. We have a uh, biannual, meaning every other year, national conference and business meeting where we get together and we do the business that the national denomination has to do and uh, but we, we try to do things more than just have a, a business meeting right uh, we have a big celebration of who we are as the free church and we have uh, speakers come in and uh, we hear messages and there's breakout sessions and there's a there's a bookstore there um, which was really cool so i could like i bought books and uh, that was fun um, and it was just a joy to be there with brothers and sisters from all across our country, but then again, and then all around the world, as we've said, so many free church people have gone out around the world to serve and to glorify Christ. But there was one thing at that event that was not a joy. And, and at that particular conference, that particular moment, we held a vote, uh, discussing the statement of faith for the free church. Now you would expect that a, a change of our statement of faith would elicit a conversation. And this is true. And we've had, we'd had a conversation for a couple of years leading up to this because the, the vote was to change the statement of faith to say that we believe in the personal bodily and glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ, rather than saying personal bodily and premillennial return of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in, in other words, what we as the free church had to ask ourselves is, do we want to make the, the fact that we would say that the that Christ's return would be premillennial and don't get hung up on terms? Just Is that a, something we want to say that that's an essential aspect of who we are as the free church? And since we acknowledge that there are Christians who disagree. We, we agree, generally speaking, uh, Christians, we should all agree that Jesus is coming back. He said that he was. But we have, there's disagreements about the timing and the nature and what's going to happen first and all these different things. And even among certain people 
um, within, you know, on broad levels, there's different camps about different things, right? That we, we all have some differing thoughts and opinions. The, really, the debate for us as the free church uh, was saying we are going to say that the return of Christ is essential. We have, you have to hold to that. But as far as the timing and other circumstances, will we as a church be willing to leave that open for discussion and debate? In other words, will we welcome a Jesus-loving amillennial brother or a Christ-exalting post-millennial sister into our fellowship with welcome arms? Is that what we will do? Now, I, on that day, I was prepared. I knew about the issue. I was an informed voter. Um, I went in and, and my conviction was we should vote yes. I have strong convictions. And I have zero problem with the previous statement of faith. And I hold my convictions pretty tightly. But I know lots of really good brothers and sisters who hold different views on end times matters. And since I know they love Jesus, and it is a debated issue, um, as far as some of those circumstances and timing, I, I thought, you know what, let's, let's not quibble over what is in essence a minor issue, but focus on the major issue. And I was perhaps maybe a little Pollyanna-ish, and I thought, we'll go in, we're going to have a quick business meeting, and we're going to discuss this, and then we'll, we'll move on. And then, then we had scheduled a time of worship, which I was looking forward to and uh, uh, a vote, or excuse me, then a, then a message, and then a big dinner, and then the conference would um, be moving on to the next day. That didn't happen. What should have been, and what could have been, a Christ-honoring discussion quickly dissolved into a heated argument. And in that, I grew more and more frustrated. So we were in a big church, the Orchard Church in Chicago. Pastor Colin Smith, if you know him, he has an online and radio ministry. I think it's radio ministry. I know an online ministry and podcast. I think he also does radio stuff. Great guy. Recommend him highly. Free church guy. Solid. Loves Jesus. That He's the lead pastor of that church. Big church, right? So I'm up here in the balcony, right? I'm in the cheap seats because that's where, you know, I got stuck. Um, but I'm up here and I'm watching all these people go down and it's not just, you know, here's my concern. If we approve this, this is what I think might happen. Blah, 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 blah. Thank you for your time. Go sit down. It was there and people would get up and they were, they were angry. And they're like, if we do this, we're going to end up, you know, next thing you know, we're going to be sacrificing kittens on the altar and stuff. And I was like, whoa, whoa. Okay, they didn't say that. But it was like that. And it was like, this is crazy. Where's all this coming from? In fact, the, conversa the, the conversation, the debate went so long that it spilled over into the worship time. We didn't have time to worship in song. And the, our national president had to like make his speech that, you know, or his speech or his, his message. He's going to preach to us, you know, a normal sermon. And he had like, had like 10 minutes. And then because the caterers were there with the dinner, we had to all, you know, get out to, to the dinner. I mean, I couldn't speak for everyone that was there, but I didn't feel much like celebrating when I went out to that dinner. And as we filed out of the sanctuary um, where the, the meeting was held, I turned uh, to a pastor friend of mine, in fact, pastor of the Free Church in Ankeny. Um, I looked at, I said, did we really just choose arguing theology over singing songs to worship Jesus? I mean... I was fine with the way the statement of faith was before. I'm fine with the way it is now. <clears throat> I mean, after all, the return of Jesus to earth is going to be pretty spectacular, right? It's going to, one might even say it's going to be glorious. That's why they chose the word. But it just seems odd to me that we were quarreling over the issue, especially since I know it's a secondary matter. And it just seems to me that the quote of the ancient theologian um, Augustine that we love in the free church, that in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity was just tossed out the window in this debate. The church in Rome had a, a similar argument, a similar debate. Because God had saved both Jews and Gentiles, putting them into one pot and stirring it up. The diverse backgrounds that they brought into the church 
because of these issues, there existed some secondary issues like what's acceptable to eat, what days should we celebrate in worship, that people in the church disagreed about and they were making these secondary issues primary issues. And they were, from what I, we can gather from the text, even going as far as to exclude some from the church based on these issues. And this is where Paul steps in. Unity is important in a church. But that unity must be around Jesus and not around secondary issues. The aim for the church is to seek unity rather than making lists of behavior. And as such, individually, we also must seek to make honoring Jesus our aim and our number one target, our primary focus. Because if Jesus is indeed Lord, then he needs to be the focus of the church and the focus of our individual lives. So as we look closer at our text again today, Paul starts off with a command. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. He says this to deal with this particular issue. The church is to welcome the one who is weak in faith. Now he goes on to describe for us what the one who is weak in faith is one who doesn't eat meat. Probably from our context, knowing that we have both Jews and Gentiles, probably because this is directed more at Jewish believers, because they couldn't confirm that the meat was kosher. If you remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about Daniel, uh, and far as when we were talking about being subject to governing authorities and how Daniel worked in the system, said, hey, I don't want to eat this, this, these things, so I'm eating vegetables only. It's how I can make sure I'm eating kosher and I'm honoring God. And that's the debate that is pulling forward even into this day in Rome. So while the particular issue is clear, is like don't squabble over what to eat, the principle that Paul wanted the church to know is that they should welcome all who come in faith and to not quarrel or divide over opinions. Now, it's important to note that he says to welcome those in faith and to not quarrel or divide over opinions. So we welcome those who proclaim the name of Jesus, who say, I'm a Christian, and we welcome them even if we disagree. And the reason that Paul gives is twofold in the text. One is that we don't judge someone else over disputable matters is because God has already welcomed the person. In other words, Paul's contention is that if God has welcomed someone to the family by adopting the person through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, who are we to judge if they're welcome in the church? Again, now that we're not talking about someone who's engaging in sin, we'll cover that more in a moment. I just want to make sure I'm clear on this. But if somebody comes in, it's one of the reasons why when we do communion, this isn't in my notes, but it just, this idea came to me. It's like when we, when we celebrate communion, the one requirement I say is that you believe in Jesus Christ. Even if you're visiting us from a different church, you are welcome to partake of communion because we're all one big family even if you happen to attend a different gathering on Sunday mornings besides this one as your regular home. Who am I to deny access to communion to somebody whom God has welcomed? The reality is that God is welcoming, uh, or excuse me, is redeeming a sinful people to himself and sinful people that come from every tribe and every tongue. We often forget that this isn't my church. This isn't your church, but it's Christ's church. This is his body. This is his family. The church isn't here to say, it isn't ours to say rather, who is in and who is out based on disputable matters such as these, as to whether or not we eat meat or we only eat vegetables or any of the other number of issues that come up today. And we all have Every one of us have strong convictions on what constitutes good and bad Christian behavior, right? We all will see someone behaving and go, oh, I don't know if that person's a Christian. 
I don't know how they can be a Christian and behave like that. We don't always say it quite like that, but that's the thought that percolates through our mind. Everyone, I don't care who you are, all of us do this. And I struggled. I was trying, okay, I got to get a good illustration. Well, that's, like, oh, I can't use that illustration. Well, what about, no, I better not use that illustration. And I struggled, not because there's not a ton of issues, secondary issues that people wanted to divide over. There's too many of them. But I was afraid that if you heard me say that such and such was a matter of liberty and your conscience says something different, if you're like, that's not a matter of liberty, you can't do that and be a Christian, that you would then just get mad at me for calling you the weaker brother or sister and just not listen to the rest of the message. Or the opposite, you're like, yeah, I'm the strong. And then you get puffed up and think, yeah, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I was afraid of us all completely ignoring the tax because this is something we do. We assume our convictions are the right convictions and that anyone who disagrees with us is clearly wrong and thus they are sinning. And even if it was true that every one of us is right, which it can't be because I know we disagree on things, so not all of us can be right all the time. The principle is this. Should we not welcome even the most vile sinner into our midst? so that we can proclaim the grace of Jesus to them? Shouldn't we say Jesus paid it all and he has paid it all for you if you'd only trust him? It should be our heartbeat. The the, so now I'm taking this principle, welcome, don't squabble, welcome people, welcome fellow believers. Now I'm taking it to another level. I'm expanding this reach. You can determine if I'm preaching above the line on this or not, but it's my conviction that the church should be the most welcoming place on earth, not accepting and approving of people's sins. That's not what I say when I say welcoming, but that we should all recognize that every one of us is simply trying to figure it out by the power of the spirit. So even if a, a brother or a sister comes in here and they've got some weird off the wall understanding of scripture, we want them welcomed here. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to let them preach or teach necessarily. But we want them here so that they can hear and they can be loved. We want that for them. Welcoming someone through those doors and being hospitable to them doesn't mean that we agree with everyone or we just ignore someone's blatant sin. That's not what this text is saying. We preach Jesus and we preach Jesus crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected. That the only way to the Father is through the Son, that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what we preach, and we preach it constantly and consistently. But we don't do it in such a way that excludes people. We want people to come. And we certainly cannot judge other servants of Christ, and we cannot be people who argue over matters of opinion. And praise God, we don't do that here. And I'm grateful for that. We must welcome all, especially the one who is weak in faith and not pass judgment because we're all Christ's servants. We seek unity around the throne of Jesus rather than a set of issues. And because Jesus saves, we welcome those that he does. So if this is true, if this principle is true, then the reality is we need to allow for people that, to disagree with us. And this is what Paul is driving at in our text. We need to first recognize that we're probably not going to all agree on everything. There's a mistaken notion in the church that we all have to agree on everything. That we all have to like the same music. We all have to use the same Bible translation. We all have to vote for the same candidate. I mean, we've all heard someone, even well-meaning Christians say, if you believe or you do X, well, then you aren't a Christian. Paul continues in the text by reminding the church that even if they disagree about these matters, we should allow for differences with one condition, that the person's aim is to honor Christ. The differences aren't what's important. What's important is that in the midst of your differences, we are unified about what truly matters, and that's honoring Christ. 
So if we agree that Paul's contention in this portion of Romans is that the church should welcome the weaker brother without judgment because the church is to be unified around Jesus and not issues, then we have to accept the fact that there's going to be a differences, difference of opinion. Now you're going to find this shocking, but two well-meaning, Jesus-loving, Christ-exalting believers can disagree on a lot of things, even deep theological issues. Two of my favorite teachers that are out there had a good-natured discussion. One might even label it a debate, but it wasn't an argument. It was a debate, and I love those um, on, on a particular theological issue. I agree with one, I disagree with the other, but at the end of it, they remained friends. They allowed for the difference even though they engaged in the difference. And I forgot to mute my phone when I brought it up here. <coughs> and it even beyond that, it applies here. I know for a fact that I hold to a slightly different view, speaking of end times theology, eschatology, that we were talking about earlier. I know I hold to a slightly different view than a lot of folks in this room. And I'm grateful that we've never let that get in the way. We've discussed it and we've worked through, you know, we talked about it, but it's never been a matter of division. And I'm grateful for that because we don't need that to distract us from our primary goal, which is to honor and glorify Christ. I think it's interesting that just before this text, Paul lists certain sins that are a contrast to walking in the light. And what's interesting isn't that he casts drunkenness and sensuality as darkness, but he also includes quarreling and jealousy. So in other words, in the Apostle Paul's spirit-inspired mind, there is no significant difference between quarreling in the church and drunkenness. There is no difference between jealousy in sensuality in regards to darkness. They are all sin and they need to be dealt with. I am convinced that Paul includes these two things in 1313 because he knows he's about to write about these issues that would later be noted as Romans 14, 1 to 9. Paul's making a point that quarreling over opinions is sin is sinful because it is sinful to argue and quarrel with someone that Jesus has redeemed. I've made it clear. We still engage in our differences, but we don't have to agree. What frustrated me the most at the, at the conference, the ECA conference, wasn't that people didn't want to see the statement of faith changed. I'm not upset that some of my brothers and sisters in the free church just felt as though holding on to our premillennial distinctive roots that go all the way back to the 1950s and beyond. The 1950s is when the Swedish and the Norwegian free churches merged and became the Evangelical Free Church of America. That even in all of that, that doesn't bother me. It really doesn't. I get where somebody might want to hold on to that. I did. I get it. What frustrated me was that the way that it, the argument went and how angry and bitter and jealous and, and, and unkind they were. We don't have to agree on everything, but we cannot quarrel. We don't need to be uniform in thought, but a call, the call is instead for unity around the spirit. Paul's aim isn't to end discussion and debate, but to remind the church that we cannot allow for these discussions and debates to cause divisions within the church. So Paul says in verse 5 that each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, this doesn't mean that each one of us gets to be our own arbiter of what sin is or isn't, right? This isn't to say, well, I think eating meat is a sin, but Lisa thinks eating meat is not a sin. Therefore, she, you know, that's just disagree. It's sin for me. It's not sin. That's not what, what he's saying there. He's giving the church a warning. He's telling them 
that if you are going to hold a particular conviction, if you're going to do something or not do something, the aim isn't to not sin. Your aim needs to be to glorify Christ. So if you eat meat, eat that meat with gratitude to the one who provided the meat. If you abstain because you think eating would dishonor God, then abstain, but abstain to the glory of God. He goes on to say that we aren't to live or to die for our own preferences, but to remember that ultimately we belong to Christ. We are the Lord's. See, Paul's point here isn't eat meat, don't eat meat. His argument here isn't be a vegetarian, don't be a vegetarian. His argument isn't celebrate this day, don't celebrate this day. That's not his argument. He isn't saying that the weaker brother, and this is fascinating to me. He's not saying that the weaker brother is wrong, which is how we always take this. And he's not saying that the stronger brother is right, which is how we always take this text. This isn't a text about who's right and who's wrong on these particular issues. Instead, Paul's aim in this text is to remind them, I don't care what you hold on secondary issues. Don't let those get in the way of the primary issue, which is to glorify Christ. We as Christians have this uncanny knack of always seeming to take that secondary issue and making it a primary issue, and that's what we divide over. We need to understand and get along with others that disagree with us because our ultimate aim is to glorify Christ, even if we disagree with the method in which we get there. So if you celebrate the day, if you eat the meat, whatever you do, do it to honor and glorify Christ. This means for each of us that whatever our preferences may or may not be, our goal should be to honor Christ rather than simply avoiding sin or ensuring that others agree to our understanding of what it takes to be holy. As much as there's been this great discussion um, over the past few years about how cultural issues have spilled into the church, I'm thinking universal, not necessarily our church specifically, and how these how these issues have caused division within churches across our country. There is something else that's coming to light as well. And that's that churches so often are unified around an idea rather than around the throne of Christ. Church unity is not the goal of this passage because it is entirely possible for the church, a church, a local church to be unified around the wrong idea. A, a local church can be unified around a wrong idea of what it means to be holy. It could be also unified around a wonderful idea such as a food pantry. But if the church's identity is the food pantry, they're missing the boat, they're missing the boat because the identity should be we worship Jesus. And then everything flows out of that. Our primary aim is to worship and glorify Jesus. And because we want to do that, there are certain things we don't do. Or we want to worship and glorify Jesus. And so as part of that, we take seriously his command to feed the hungry. So we have a food pantry. We want to honor and worship Jesus. And he says that we should tell others about him. So we do that or whatever the case may be. But it flows from the worship and celebration of Christ, not around the particular issue. And it's easy for us to get wrapped up and be unified around a particular translation of the Bible or a particular worship style or a particular belief or any number of things. I don't think Paul is advocating for a church that has no convictions in this text, but instead he is advocating and saying that you can be unified around being vegetarian or you can be unified around Jesus. And for a whole plethora of reasons, I want to be unified around Jesus, not around being vegetarian. Amen? Thank you. Some laughter. I appreciate that. Um, since you are Christ, since you belong to him, then we need to be unified around him. Do you remember a few weeks ago, we looked at the idea that um, 
we should owe only love to people because if we love others, we'll fulfill the law. Remember, we looked at that a few verses ago. Same idea applies to this text. The reason this dispute arose in the church wasn't that one side was uh, just preferred vegetables over meat. The issue was they were all trying to live a Christ-exalting life. The issue was everyone agreed that they wanted to be a holy church. They all agreed that, as I think all of us do, I mean, especially those of us who are here on Memorial Day weekend, right? I mean, come on. We want to live a holy life. Right? We want to glorify and honor Jesus. We don't want to sin. We want to walk in the light. But so often we fundamentally misunderstand how we get there. So our aim must be to glorify Jesus rather than simply to avoid sin, which is what these people were doing. They thought, I will glorify Jesus by not sinning. And Paul is saying, listen, the issue isn't whether you eat or don't eat. The issue is you need to keep your issue on focusing Christ. Focus on him. Now this is going to change how we do a lot of things in the world. Because we have this great temptation and tendency to see the world as a giant list of do's and don'ts. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I see someone nodding. We see the world as a list of do's and don'ts, don't we? We see, well, I'm a Christian, so I should do this. And I'm a Christian, so I should not do that. Do's and don'ts, that's how we see it. And this is what the Roman church was dealing with as well. I should believe this. I should not believe that, right? This is, this is how this all flows. And the problem when you have those lists of do's and don'ts is that ultimately what you're saying is that I have to perform a certain way in order to earn God's affection. I have to perform a certain way in order to earn God's favor in my life. I want God to bless me. I want God to care about me. Therefore, I'm going to obey all of his rules. Paul's saying something completely different. You need to glorify Christ because he lived and died and rose again to free you from your sins. Period. Everything else you do should flow out of that. Wow, Jesus died for me? Well, why wouldn't... The, the end result is often the same, but the motive and the heart behind it isn't. And when the motive changes, when we're saying, listen, I'm free in Christ... And somebody does something, you're like, you know what? Okay. I get the aim of not wanting to sin. I don't want to sin. But if our aim is to avoid sin, we may miss the, well miss the larger target of glorifying Christ because we don't care about whether, uh, because, not because we don't care about whether we sin or not, but we just may be ignorant. We may be unaware of a particular law or a rule. So, but if our aim then is to glorify Christ, to honor him, then in whatever we do, we won't sin because it is impossible to sin if you are genuinely seeking to glorify him. You got to trust the spirit on this. The spirit will guide and give you wisdom. If your aim is to glorify Christ in every area of your life, the Spirit will protect you and will guide you. That's the Spirit's job. So rather than asking if something is sinful or not, which you hear all the time, right? I hear, Pastor, can I do this? Pastor, I would swear. Um, there's a podcast, John Piper asks people email in questions and, and all this time. I would swear half of them, Pastor John is such and such sin. Pastor John is a good Christian. Can I do such and such? You're missing the point. The point of the matter is, am I seeking to glorify Christ? Is the church seeking to glorify Christ? And I praise God that I think that we as a church are doing that. And speaking of that, I'm grateful that we show one another grace. 
Because the reality is, is that, yeah, we may understand that all foods are clean and that you don't have to keep kosher, but if someone comes in and uh, doesn't, they insist on being a vegetarian for the glory of Christ, then we shouldn't judge them for it. We show grace because we don't know that person's story. We don't know where they came from. Because the reality is that Jesus is saving and redeeming a people from sin to himself. And if that's the case, there's going to be a whole lot of people around the throne in Revelation (laughs) that we won't have agreed with on this earth. And you know what? At that point, it won't matter. And that's the glory of the whole thing. We might as well start practicing for eternity today. Yes, we deal with obvious sin. That goes without saying. It's not part of this text, but it goes without saying. We call everyone to repentance, but we don't judge every motive. Show grace and kindness to all, pointing them to the one who died and rose again. So as we wrap up on this Memorial Day, let me remind you. Let me do two things first. Let me thank you again from the bottom of my heart, both the people here, people who might see this later. I am so eternally grateful for a church that doesn't make secondary issues primary ones. I love you guys for that. It's one of the many, it's honestly one of the main reasons over all the years I've wanted to stay here. Not just that I decided I I want to be here because you guys don't argue about those things. I don't hear, I hear questions and said, Pastor, why would you say one Bible translation is better than another? Not my translation is better than all of yours. Hey, Pastor, what do you think about this theological point of view? Or what, what about this particular text? Help me understand it. Versus, well, I've got it all figured out and you need to do it my way. And if you don't, I'm leaving. Thank you. From the bottom of your pastor's heart, thank you. You make my job infinitely easier when I'm not having to argue. And I also know that that sort of unity around the glory of Christ is hard. It's easy or it's easy to lose. And once it's gone, it's hard to get back. So let's all, the challenge from this text then, is for us all to continue to be humble before Christ and to seek his face in those issues. Because there's a world out there who wants to tear us apart. But we demonstrate to, to the world that there can be a, we can learn how to disagree agreeably around the throne of Christ for his glory. Thank you for welcoming me, your weaker brother, all these years. Let's continue to be a people who welcomes both the strong and the weak, those who have faith and want to honor Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you. Again, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this day uh, that we could look at this text. Help us as we continue to study over the next few weeks about um, how we encourage one another to make this our aim to follow Christ, that we don't hinder, but we help. Help us in that over the next few weeks. And Father, I would be remiss on this Memorial Day weekend if we didn't thank you for those brave men and women who have sacrificed their lives to allow our country to have the, or to recognize the liberty you give men to worship you. So we thank you uh, from our hearts for those who have sacrificed in such a way. And ultimately, we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ who died to set us free from sin. Help us to go this week to love and to honor and to serve you. Amen.